So a very, very good morning to all of you. And we are very, very lucky to have with us uh, Professor Vikas Rawal, who needs very little introduction, but I will introduce him anyway, apart from being for the Center for Economic Studies and Planning at the Jawaharlal Nehru University and an expert in developmental economics, agricultural economics, and what he calls applied econometrics. Uh, but I think what we're really going to be talking about today is uh, the impact of the COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, we've assumed the lockdown to have been a necessity, and I think only recently, uh, with the plight of migrant workers, has the, not just the sagacity and the wisdom, but the completely unplannedness in which the lockdown was uh, called and carried out, callousness, in fact, uh, coming to light. So today's discussion is lockdown impact, disrupted harvest, lost jobs and hunger, especially in rural India. Now, a very important study that has come before us is like a monograph, which I would recommend everybody thinking Indian should read, is from the Society for uh, Social and uh, Economic Research, SSER, uh, where there's, uh, there's Vikas Raval, there's Manish Kumar, Ankur Varma, and Jessica Pei that together done this study. And it raises very, very se serious issues on the impact on the farmers, rural economy in general, and of course, hunger. So these are some of the areas that we will deal with. So uh, Professor Raval, before we get to the decoding of your very, very substantive monograph, uh, I would just like to ask, uh, what immediately needs to be done? I mean, what would your recommendations be? One, two, three, four, for small middle farmers, for all farmers, for landless laborer, rural worker, Manrega, for Monday's agricultural markets, for the restoration of the supply chain, especially pesticides, etc., as you pointed out in your report, for hunger alleviation, given the grains that the FCI has. These are just some point pointers I had from your own work. What immediately needs to be done before we get to de decoding your report? If, uh, if we are talking about the immediate thing, things that did need to be done immediately, I would, uh, I can think of three things that I think are the most important should be done right away. One is uh, distribution of public stock. You just need to expand public distribution, just do a universal entitlement until this whole crisis is over. You just have to say that everybody is entitled to 10 kilos of grain a month or whatever, but that entitlement is not subject to your having a ration card or Aadhaar card or no nothing. Anybody who goes to a ration shop and demands to get wheat or rice or, or, or pulses should be given the, the grain. So that's number one. Uh, uh, give, giving out uh, food grain, uh, you see that's in, in a sense the, the most uh, one positive thing that one could say about about Indian economy that we were sitting on a large stock of food grain you see so so leveraging that is the most important most eminently feasible thing that should be done immediately there's no there's no two way about it you refer to strategically using that grain you refer to That's that right. for the second is uh, immediately uh, expanding the ambit of uh, the rural employment guarantee scheme you know, using that to put money in the hands of the people. And there I would say two things. One, that the guarantee scheme has a provision for payment of unemployment allowance. You had two months when the entire uh, sort of, uh, 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 you know, population of Enrega workers, the job card holders, were out of work. 7.3 crore registered, I think. Yeah. Were out of work because you could not provide them work. You suddenly announced the lockdown. They had no time to apply for work if you if you make an application a mandatory. Yeah, Professor Raval, you're breaking up. Can you repeat that? For hours, they had no time to. Can you just apply. repeat that sentence? There was a slight drop in the connection. You see, the point is that uh, the 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 Narega has a provision for payment of unemployment allowance. There is a requirement for making an application. You see, but you could not workers could not apply because you announced the lockdown for in a with a notice of four hours. So you know you have to just uh, do away with all those restrictions. And for the entire period during which, because of lockdown, Narega workers were unable to work. You should give them unemployment allowance. And you have to then think of expanding the uh, work in under NREQ for rest of the year, so that a larger number of people are able to uh, are able to work through through NREQ. That's number two. 
Number three would be to compensate farmers for the losses they have incurred because of complete disruption of uh, of uh, of uh, harvesting for a whole lot of crops. But even more importantly, disruption of agricultural marketing for over a month. Uh, the the costs that were associated with it. the crop losses that happened because of it all of that would have to be compensated so these are the three things which i think should be on the sort of top of the agenda in so far as uh, dealing with the rural crisis uh, do you see that happening in the sense before i get to the report again given the fact that you've actually as you mentioned in your own report you actually see the government trying to say that we'll use this opportunity to deregulate apmcs uh and uh, bring in corporates into the uh into the agriculture sector you see quote and quote land uh acquisition laws being uh, again all the statutory requirements which corporates had to undergo uh so that uh, rapacious land acquisition did not happen uttar pradesh has said that it will remove it many other states are going to go the same way so quite apart instead of alleviating the uh, the distress and the mistakes of the last two and a half three months it looks as if the government is exacerbating them i think there is uh, two sides to it you see one is uh, uh, so 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 uh, you know your first question yes well i don't th- see this happening i don't think the government is you know uh, sort of trying to do any of this mm. uh, but there are two sides to this one is a denial of distress you see you are you're not willing to accept that there is distress you have you know every news ch- channel barring you know obviously the ones uh, the godi media as, as it is called have shown images of the 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 crisis of migrant workers of you know the crisis of livelihood ngos have been running uh, community kitchen something that even government has acknowledged by the way government offered to sell them at market prices grain to to run community we kitchen bought, so, so the cjp so, bought grain from fci right so so right. so the fact that there is that crisis is uh, is uh, known but not acknowledged okay? so the government is in a denial mode in so far as the crisis is concerned and uh, that is uh, one aspect of this the second is the more sinister where you are know, you are not just denying that there is a crisis you are actually using it as an opportunity to to do things that you could not do in normal time yeah. you see all these things that the government is not trying to do whether it's apmc reforms whether it is you know reform of tenancy act whether it's you know uh, getting rid of eca these are things that have been in the air you know they've been talking about this yeah. they have not been able to do it but what is sinister is that you know you actually think that this is your moment when people are all locked up there is no uh, the 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 resistance is muted the opportunity the possibility for people to speak up is is uh, circumscribed and you can use this moment to now test the waters to try out these reforms you know that's the sinister part of it that you are trying to do things that you would not be able to do otherwise and not only you are trying to do it this way you are actually saying it also yeah so you know which is what makes it the worst you know which is uh, really the worst you know the niti ayog ceo amitabh kant actually wrote you will not get another opportunity like this this is the opportunity to see yeah. you see you you have one after another spokespersons of the government who actually even expressed it this way that you know this is the this is the opportunity to see you know that is the sinister side of it yeah. but you see the point is that the 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 hypocrisy of this is another thing that needs to be called down you know you are saying that apmc reforms are being done to give choices to farmers apmc reforms are being done to give choices to traders and big business you see the eca is being done not to give choices to consumers eca is being amended to give choices to big uh, wholesalers to hold uh, food commodity this is so you are doing these things not because uh, 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 you are giving choices to consumers or to farmers you are you are you are uh, uh, doing this because you are uh, giving choices to your corporate masters that's that's quite clear 
uh, the the report that you have uh, all brought out this monograph uh, speaks in detail uh, and and also highlights the whole issue of the disruption agricultural harvest and this is very little known in uh, urban india though some of us have been tracking it sort of episodically as journalists you know like we found when our team was working in assam for instance we found a reflection on what of what you had said in your india's uh, villages under covid because we found uh, tracks of uh, district of assam with the traditional nimbu and kakadi and bengan and tomato uh, uh were had to even feed them to cattle because there was no supply chain available for the horticulturists even the dairy issue came up in parts yes. of the yes. uh, barak valley etc yes. so would you speak to us a little bit about the disruption in harvest that indian farmers have gone through and yes. how that happened and how it could have been avoided so you see there are two things one is that uh, there's no planning there's no preparation you didn't think of this that that harvest was happening in some places it was about to happen and so on and that there is this whole diversity of both agro climatic uh, context and crops that farmers grow there are uh, you know different kinds of requirements you had made no preparation for it you had made no plans for it the second thing is that when the lockdown happened the first few weeks it was the most ruthless regime you know you had cops who were just beating up people left right and center wherever they could indiscriminately not allowing people to come out not allowing people to assemble now you see harvesting is the task which you know the entire series of things that have to be done harvest and post harvest are tasks that require people to assemble you know i mean 10 people have to work together to do the harvesting then threshing has to happen like that you know threshing. in haryana punjab for example you know you get a threshing machine overnight threshing happens it's very hot summer so people do, do typically thresh their grain at night so at night uh, the 15 people will assemble and the threshing would happen now the you know loading unloading of these are all tasks for which substantial labor mobilization has to happen but you had this after the ruthless uh, lockdown regime in the first few weeks in particular where the you had the first few weeks a situation where harvesting was disrupted yeah. the people were not even allowed to harvest the second aspect of this was not allowing people to sell not not allowing uh, people to take their produce to the market right that is something that went on for much longer the mondays opened pretty much towards the end of the second phase of lockdown so you had a fairly long period where barring you know a few mondays barring a few mondays dealing primarily with the most perishable commodity right you know where there was also some demand and some sort of urgency to deal with it you know a little bit of that was being sold other than that you basically the shut the mondays down Yeah. you know we did that calculation you know in the yeah. first phase of uh, lockdown if you compare it with the amount of sales last year only 6% of wheat was sold right. and i think chana was only about 4% and uh, mustard was also about like that so so you know uh, hardly any sales happened now and, and you're you're a very good harvest a very good harvest a very good harvest farmers are sitting on this grain and you see farmers are not able to sell it results in all kinds of problems one is that you also had over this period several spells of hail storm rain in 59% of the geographical area of the country there was about 59% of uh, uh, geographical area of the country had more than 60% excess rainfall my god yeah yeah so you had a very large part of the area where there was just too much rain there was hail storms and all of that which meant that the grain that was ready to be harvested grain that was already harvested was exposed and farmers don't have you know covered storage facilities to keep their grain for weeks on so so you had higher losses because uh, the, this grain was exposed you also had another problem you see the, you were not able to sell your produce for for a month or sometimes two months to store so that, store you had to store it but that also meant that your interest burden you were unable to repay your loans yeah so yeah. the interest burden piles up you had to invest in first taking the grain to your uh, house or to your cattle shed or wherever you could possibly store it 
get it un- offloaded there then when it was time to take it to the mandi get it loaded again onto tractor trolleys take it again all of this means additional labor cost you see so the cost of production has gone up losses have gone up because of all of this you see farmers had to incur additional costs to get all this done mm-hmm. now all of this basically means that farmers costs have risen their uh, losses have increased and they have to be compensated now you see what is terrible is that on 15th of may when the finance minister was announcing a relief package she talked about 6400 crore rupees having been given by insurance companies through the pm uh, fasal bima yojana now this is just you know utterly dishonest i would say and that there's no other word for it all these claims are claims pending claims of the past seasons nobody has been compensated for losses of this this, this season, season. Okay. you know so to put this as uh, as compensation and relief for what is going on now is really a travesty the second thing is that under pm kisan if you look at the p- structure of premium of the total premium anything between 50 to 80% of premium is paid by farmers, by farmers yeah. this is money that farmers have paid to call this as relief by government is utterly dishonest farmers have paid for this you know this is this government has shifted the agricultural insurance scheme to a scheme which is run by private insurance companies in which payment is primarily paid by farmers the rest of it is divided equally between state and central governments but the lion share of it is farmers payment yeah, yeah. so you know i mean to call this as compensation and relief government given by central government is really a travesty you also mentioned and in the agricultural sector there was this huge problem particularly about perishables apart from wheat and uh, uh, chana mustard and ra- paddy the perishables and also about milk is a very sharp uh, observations yes, in your report and i think maybe the only honest thing the other the finance minister says when she was talking about milk being thrown on the streets or whatever yeah, she herself said it she 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 announced that there was a decline of 20 to 25% uh, uh, decline in the demand for milk the milk was being thrown on the streets is something that she acknowledged now but then what does she do she says that we procured i think 111 crore liter extra milk to support farmers you know again a, a lie being parroted here see what is this 110 extra liters you procure 560 liters of milk per day how much did you procure prior to that prior to the lockdown roughly the same amount you know maybe a little bit less uh, but you know more or less in the same range okay what you are saying is that the demand has fallen by 25% so the sales of uh, cooperatives have fallen and that extra that the produce that they are unable to sell which they convert into skim milk powder or butter or ghee and store it because that's what has shelf life and you sell it later is again uh, relief being provided by government to farmers neither has the government given money to dairy cooperatives yeah. nor have dairy cooperatives given any additional money to farmers farmers <laughs> you see it's the same amount of procurement that you used to do yeah. okay your only given the sort of uh, mercy the small mercy is that cooperatives have not reduced the the procurement that they used to do we, we got some news initially that that happened, happened. to some extent yeah. but yeah. i suppose you know that was uh, uh, sort of taken care of and you know Uh, uh it was ensured that they, they don't cut down on their procurement because there was a fall in demand but they have not provided any additional relief the prices of milk and dairy cooperatives only uh, buy a part of the total milk supply the fact is that private dairies uh, informal milkmen they t- uh, are also uh, they also account for a bulk of uh, uh, m- m- milk sales and all of that practically stopped in villages after villages that we covered in our our, our our village study series showed that milk was not being purchased all the private uh, dairies and informal uh, milkmen who used to buy milk and supply them to the cities stopped doing so because there's no demand yeah the people who lost their jobs the, you know had no money to buy milk so i mean uh, i think two dates in your report struck me very sharply when i read it a couple of times one is uh, march 27th and the other one is april 20th and the reason why i mention is because the lockdown is suddenly called like you said in at four hours notice 
and then nothing has been thought of for the mondays till march 27th when the they are technically to a gr allowed to function again and april 20th is when the not notification for manrega is put out that manrega work will not be stopped but which also means like you said that for a whole month there was nothing happening or nothing was allowed to happen so even after march 27th when the mondays were supposedly allowed to start uh, functioning again uh, whether it's the police whether it's the administration bad messaging bad political intent it just didn't happen the mondays as you show in your report were not functioning sure. how do the monday work if you can just tell the viewer and the listener and what is this non functioning of the monday actually meant to the farming sector You see, so so the point is that the farmers take their uh, produce to the uh, the APMC mandis, and in the mandis that that uh, grain is weighed, it is uh, you know unloaded, it is uh, put into bags, it is sometimes cleaned. There is that whole thing, and then there is this auctioning that happens, and then the 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 grain is taken. Now all of this, starting from the village. You see, you have to load it into your tractor trolleys or bullock carts and so on. Take it to the mandi, you know, get into the mandi and and then do that whole thing. Now the point is that one is that when on March twenty seven you come out with a notification, that's a central government notification. By the time it reaches the states, you know, there is already a week or ten days that have passed. Yeah. Then the the whole process of it, you see, it requires labor. Now one big problem, for example, was combine harvesters. you see the combine harvesters are owned by people in punjab they go to maharashtra they go to maharashtra they go to madhya pradesh and they start moving northwards because the harvesting starts in the central india early mm -hmm. and the punjab is the last one to have the harvest so they they move northwards as the the harvesting season progresses but this time they just couldn't reach madhya pradesh they could never reach madhya pradesh so how did would harvesting happen in madhya pradesh so a lot of it simply happened manually it did took much longer it costed a lot more and so on so even when you came out with that notification for you to work out the the institutional process through which combine harvesters will actually move took another 3 weeks by then it was too late anyway for combine harvesters to go because combine harvesters were then going to be needed in punjab so you know things of this kind you know putting these things in place there was a lag and you see the thing is that you were not thinking ahead you were thinking on the day when the problem came uh, uh, you were confronted with the problem so when you started you said oh punjab harvesting is still 15 days uh, uh, there's still 15 days to go go for it so we we don't have to worry you started worrying about punjab harvesting when punjab harvesting was about to start yeah. similarly you know you didn't think of mango because you said okay mango happens in whatever end of may or something in maharashtra and then gujarat and it happens much later elsewhere you didn't think of lychees in bihar or something you know you start thinking of it when the, the problem the, when the problem happens and then you you have no time to resolve it so you see that was another problem that those whoever was taking the decision every day a new problem appeared you just have to repeat that there was a small gap yeah Whoever, they, they, they were not thinking ahead hmm. of the problems that were going to happen. They were not planning, preparing for it. They were firefighting. Yeah. When you had a problem, you said, "Okay, now let's resolve it." But then, but before you can manage to resolve it, there is the next problem. Okay. So you see, th th that was that. That's how things were happening. Now, once they started to open the mandis, they said that they were going to allow something like thirty or forty farmers a day. into the mandi because of social distancing now if that's the rate at which you're going to allow farmers into the mandis how long will it take so you see the by the time it's only towards the end of the second phase of the lockdown that the number of mandis that were barely functional reached roughly the level of the last day that's it early may yeah. early may or something it basically it took you about two uh, phases of the lockdown yeah. to somewhat resume it yeah. but you see you would not thought of how you are going to resume yeah. so the, the as you resumed you were confronted with another problem that uh, the disease started spreading yeah. in the yeah, mandis the so mandis became the super spreaders yeah. Yeah. and mandis started closing down yeah. so if you look at the graphs that we have in our reports in the third phase the number of functional mandis start falling again and there is a fairly significant fall 
in the number of mandis functioning in this third phase and that fall is much sharper than the last year. There's some decline that is natural because the harvesting season sort of starts coming to an end. But there's a very sharp fall. And it was clearly because the Mondays were shutting down because the, they became the, the, the location where the disease started spreading. You see, and you had not planned for this. Yeah. You see, if you if you are unable to provide PPE kits to your doctors and nurses, yeah. where was the possibility of providing them to your, uh, you know, commission agents and traders and farm workers or mandi workers in the mandi? You know, there, there's no such equipment available. So that basically meant that, uh, you know, you you uh, try to get out of one problem in the mandis, you got into another. You see, and again, it was basically because you're not planned, you're not prepared. There's no foresight. Is it, uh, I mean, this is a slightly off, off, off the uh, beaten track question. In terms of uh, a government facing a crisis of this kind, uh, certainly doesn't help if you've got an autocratic outlook and if you have a majoritarian mindset. Uh, because you need to have the help of scientists, economists, uh, agriculturalists. You need to be able to listen. You need to be able to have listen to state governments. Maybe listen to states like Kerala a bit more than you want to because they have certain success uh, uh, success possibilities. Maybe have an interstate council because states in our country are not used to talking to each other. So I mean, they only talk through the centers. So you have to have an interstate council so that people are, are kind of coming together to have conversations. So none of this happened. None of this was allowed to happen. It was almost as if one or two or three people were kind of giving diktats. Yeah. Uh, and uh, carrying this wonderful uh, program forward till yeah. it all started falling apart. Yeah. In fact, you see, the, there are two things to it. And, and I think that the first one is very important, which is that why is it that you did not start doing all of what you just mentioned, you know, having a high level committee, having an empowered group of ministers or, or you know, interstate uh, body to deal with it or, you know, having experts uh, on the job, etc. Say in January, why was it not done two months in advance? The whole world was dealing with this pandemic. Yeah. You see, and that is a question that must be asked. You know, and you know, the accountability for this, why is it that the preparation for this did not start two months ahead? Why is it that you did not put in place this entire uh, s s sort of institutional setup yeah. to deal with the crisis that was imminently coming? You see, so that's very important. The second thing is that, you know, you not only did not do it two months in advance, you never did it. Never did. Not, not even now. Not Nothing. even now. So you don't know who's taking the decisions. Yeah. It's perhaps just a bunch of bureaucrats who are deciding, uh, you know, on a day to day basis, what they're going to do, you know, depending on whatever is the channel of information they have. Correct. But you just have not reached out to either experts or civil society or, you know, uh, political leaders or, or stakeholders. State or or stakeholders. other yeah. stakeholders and said, OK, let's sit down together and figure out how to deal with this. Yeah. You see, whatever the political views, you see, everybody understands that there is a situation of crisis. Can and I? this is a moment where if you are asked, okay, tell me what, what should I do? I'm not going to say I don't like you fellows and therefore I'm not going to advise you. Yeah. In the crisis, everybody would have risen to this and, and said, okay, let's come together and, and, and deal with it. But you would not do it. Because you don't have that attitude of wanting to work together. Yeah, you don't want to work with anybody. You obviously didn't think of this. So so I think it's both this, the lack of uh, advanced, uh, doing it in advance, lack of uh, having the foresight to prepare for it. And I think that's really uh, a, a criminal act that has happened. Yeah. And it's something for which uh, accountability must be, must be held. On why is it that the government did not make preparations? And if they did, what did they do? in a white paper or something of that kind needs to be placed which says what was government's preparedness for it 678 lives at the very minimum lost we are not even talking about chronic hunger and the livelihood loss yes. uh, that, that, that we'll come to in a minute you know that the kind of job loss and I mean, depression i mean i don't know all sorts of things that people are facing i think we should talk a little bit about the misleading statements of this government on the rural work program, Manrega, because I think Manrega is going to become very crucial in the days to come, even with all the failures of the past. And your report deals with it at some length. Uh, particularly, uh, I, I was struck by the fact that you had 2019-20, you had 27 
1.3 crore registration of Malarega workers. But whereas actually only 9 crore something, that is only a third actually got the work. For whatever reason uh, the government gave. But that means only a third of people who are registered even last year, uh, through the last year got the work. So in this time of crisis, if there's going to be this bureaucratic bungling and this juggling as to who deserves it or who doesn't deserve it and why are they turned away. At a time when everybody needs the work and we need to expand the rural work program and the funding for it. Uh, what are the real steps that need to be taken? Okay, let's first understand one thing about NREG. And this is a problem that has always been there to some extent, yeah. even during the time that UPA was in power. Yeah. But it has really become much worse now which is that this is a program that is was designed as an employment guarantee program, which was going to be demand driven. That is, if a person demands work, then within 15 days, within five kilometers of person's normal place of residence, you were obliged to provide work. And if you could not do so, you would uh, give the person unemployment allowance. Okay, That's the basic design of the scheme. Now, in reality, this scheme has never worked like that. The scheme has always been, like any other employment public works program, a supply driven program. The work is organized. When the work is organized, workers are called and told, okay, now the work is available, you can work for it and you get paid for it. Many times even that doesn't happen, you know, there are all kinds of corruption involved in this, but leave that aside. The point is that it is always been uh, uh, implemented actually as a supply side program. When you it should not have been. Yeah. Been it should have been the US. And you've done that essentially by bureaucratizing hugely this whole system of demanding work. That this demand has to be given in written, it has to be submitted in a particular way, this, that and so on. And if that has been done, that has not been done, then the worker is not demanded and therefore the you have no obligation to provide work. But it now turns out that even if you take that, there are actually a lot of people who are demanding work. So what is being now shown is that the work is offered to them, but they don't do it. And therefore the work is not done. So you see, you are actually doing the, the you know the next level of fudging, where you're basically saying the work is demanded, we offer the work, but nobody does the work. People are not willing to do it. And therefore the work is not being done. So you see, I think there is a serious problem in the way NREG is being implemented. It is uh, uh, being bureauc it has been bureaucratized. It is not being uh, implemented in the spirit of uh, uh, the act. Uh, and and uh, the, the, therefore, you know, you have a certain allocation of money. You have a certain projection that so much work will be generated in, in each place uh, in a particular month. And you basically just do that much. Okay. Now, in, the, in this period, during this period, you in fact did not even do that. No. So you made a certain projection for April, you did not meet even those projections. No. In a situation where there was such a massive crisis of employment and livelihoods, you just did not, uh, uh, you know, uh, create even the employment that you had projected you would create. 12% of it or something. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's that's the situation. Now, now again, you know, just like the food stocks, as I was saying, is, you know, grain lying with you, you could use it. NREGA would have been the lifeline, you know, yeah. in a situation where you had, you know, even if one uh, takes the argument that this kind of lockdown was necessary, you know, if you had something like this, the, the, you Allowance know. Allowance would have been paid. And NREG work could have been organized. That could have been used as your palliative uh, in a situation such as this. But you did not do it. You know? So and that's. Now, when it comes to the allocation from the finance minister, when she sort of uh, talks about, uh, I think, a 90,000 crore increase, maybe. 40,000 crore. 40,000. A total is 90,000. Yeah. Okay. A yeah, total is 90,000. Yeah. Uh, which is actually not at all sufficient. Yeah, and, and you not, projected you projected a much much larger figure. Well, we've said two point two five lakh crores. Yeah, uh, instead of ninety thousand crores that is available, if you were to provide, uh, uh, there are eight point some crore uh, active workers, and let's say another one crore workers, so nine nine and a half crore workers. If you had to provide employment for hundred days to so many workers. Even, you know, even just for this, I'm not talking of all the Narega workers who are registered. 
because you actually can, your oh, right. um, yes, workers are much higher, much much. Oh, okay, much higher. Your actually registered workers are much higher. But even if you take active workers and say, okay, let's add a lakh to it, and there's already a large number of. I forgot. I, I think the number we lost last time was something like fourteen lakh applications for new job cards oh. during the lockdown. During the period of lockdown, there has been, as per the the ministry data, you have something like fourteen lakh new applications for job cards. So there is a huge demand for work, and you are not able to provide it. Now you know the fact that, in fact, the question needs to be asked: If, as per your records, you are providing work. and people are not taking it in a time of this crisis what is wrong you have to explain it yes there has to be some reason for that there has to be some reason for it you know why is it that you uh, you are not informing them on time what, what is what's wrong with you that you know the the work is not exercise or is it a paper exercise the bureaucracy which is uh, coming in the way the unemployment stress is all going to be the other huge uh, problem which is already been predicted by cmi and you know that 30% of india worked actually was productive in that period of the lockdown which means 70% of the normal persons who work were not working uh, we had the whole problem of the large number of large amounts of food grain in fci go downs which are not being disbursed despite the hunger so there's unemployment stress there is this food grain this thing and i'm just asking now a political question that uh, state governments are worried because state governments have not got their share from gst and for a lot of funding issues how much of all this is to blame can be at the state government's door because it seems to me that the state governments are almost fearful of criticizing the central government openly because then their share would get cut even further because this government unlike other governments sort of plays with the packages it gives governments uh, it never gave kerala enough during the floods we all know that so uh, i mean how does one look at this in terms of the federal structure that you have so much being decided by the center despite many uh, items being on the concurrent list and uh, politically the states are also going to take the blame as they need to take the blame because they are governing these states and provinces i've lost your voice i can't hear you no i think the i can't hear you sorry yeah hello yeah uh, so there are two things you see i uh, let's uh, first take the specific question of how much is the the uh, fault of the states mm. you see and i would say that the primary responsibility in this case lies on the center uh, whether the states could have uh, coped with it on their own uh, well kerala is an example where the state actually tried to cope with the in in the uh, 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 the the fact that the central government was not doing what it should have done okay uh, but leave that aside i think the fact that there's no preparedness for it the primary burden or the responsibility for it lies on the central government okay that's number 1 you know the whether the states could have done some preparation etc maybe yes but you know the primary responsibility for this lies clearly on the center and it is the center which has the convening power also if you know any interstate uh, collaboration has to happen anything has to happen at the national level the second thing is that uh, that when central government takes decisions which are you know take a net short notice suddenly announce you know the finance minister or the prime minister or some somebody like that comes on tv at 8 o'clock and makes an announcement you see you then can't blame the center for not promptly seizing the 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 state the state, the, the, the state for seizing that offer so for for example uh, prime under prime minister garib kalyan on the yojana you said that we will double everybody's entitlement of grain but in the month of april while nfsa distribution was something like 43 lakh crores the That's national food security act yeah. national yeah. food security act allocation was something like 43 lakh crores the allocation under garib kalyan on the yojana was only 26 or 29 lakh crores so it was you no know, far short of double now you could argue that uh, you know we announced the states were supposed to do the offtake and distribute come on i mean you 
they did it today and they said okay so t- tomorrow you, have, you start doing it now you know it, it's not an it's a task which states have to make preparations for and do it and there is a lack now i don't think the re- the responsibility for this can be placed on the shoulders of the state governments it is central government they should have made this announcement one month ago they should have said if there is a lockdown we will increase the allocation they should have made sure that the grain reached the states in advance that so the state could pick it up yeah the grain was there uh, for them to use uh, you so so i think the primary responsibility lies on the center now what is clearly uh, the, the second uh, uh, aspect of this is of course the fact that uh, in terms of resource generation the states have been really hit very hard you know they were already reeling under the whole sort of gst regime yeah. discriminating against them the central government not paying them even the dues that they were supposed they had promised to pay the states and and all of that their resource uh, generation capabilities are seriously circumscribed because of the whole change in the taxation systems that have taken place in the, uh, in the sort of last few years uh you have a situation where states are actually reeling under a financial uh, the, the a resource crisis and this includes even states like kerala yeah. you know which have been very proactive in dealing Correct. with crises which have become a model not just for india but actually in the whole world yeah. on how to deal with this crisis yeah. uh, you are actually going to be reeling with a serious uh, resource crisis with an economic crisis you have very little means to deal with because uh, uh you know you just don't have resources that are required to do the kinds of things that need to be done and the central government is simply not stepping up to the task you see so so that problem is there it's going to have a very long term impact on uh, economic conditions across the states and unfortunately we have very little to do the problem here is that there is also the difference between the states that are uh, bjp ruled states and others you know and the 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 there are a whole bunch of bjp rule states where basically central government runs its writ yeah. if central government says that you know bring an ordinance to reform apmc act next day madhya pradesh brings it next day you know up brings it next day haryana brings it and and so on and so forth yeah. so, so so gujarat brings it so you know the point is that uh, i mean these are states which are practically passes an order and these guys do it so you know Uh, uh the any possibility for having uh, 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 a dialogue or you know some uh, sort of cooperation across the states is also uh, undermined because there are these states which are ruled by bjp government which basically would not do anything for this guy and then of course we are not talking about it yeah but the whole question of labor reforms and all of that is also making things much much worse for a whole section of people of course uh, i just do i know there's been this dispute about whether the grains were rotting or not the the the, uh, the surplus which is there with the uh, food corporation of india is not not denied that there's a huge surplus of grain forget whether it's a rotting grain or whether it's good grain uh, and like you said in your report strategically it should be released as you said right in the beginning of the conversation uh coming back to the situation for hunger because i mean you said very eloquently in your report as instead by others that we are really very high on the global hunger index we are uh, very low on nutrition a large number of our people don't have not just enough food but don't have the right kind of food so we really should be looking at and 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 with the covid 19 pandemic you are even more susceptible if you don't have proper nutrition any sort of health situation is made worse so what i mean looking at fci and looking at the green situation a few words on that and then i just want a word on the opposition i mean how do we need to mobilize an opposition on all these issues yeah, okay union whether it's, whether it's civil society who does it whether it's political because at the moment it's so fractured and so difficult i mean fortunately because of work your like yours and some work of journalists and some channels the plight of mi- migrant workers and stuff is really shaken up even the middle class but but for it to sustain we need to organize this opposition it needs to be organized it needs to be focused it needs to be sustained because we are dealing with a very brute center you see okay let's first talk of the food and hunger yeah. uh, one is that the you know whatever estimates you take you know whether it's fao if pre whoever and we've done our own estimates uh, using nss data 
uh, there is no doubt that India is the country with largest number of hungry people. Yeah. It's the country where the the number of people who do do not get to consume enough calories of food just to be able to do their normal functioning is the largest. The absolute number of people who uh, do not eat on a normal day adequate amount of food is largest in this country. There is also clear evidence. Uh, despite all the data that have been concealed by the government, there is fairly clear evidence that the food insecurity uh, over the last few years has exacerbated. That things have become worse, and there are many more people. The food insecurity has increased. Many more people are hungry, and so on. There are various uh, estimates, and all of them suggest to a worsening of the situation. There is no doubt that things would have become much worse during the period of lockdown. I mean, the, I don't think any thinking person, anybody who's reading the newspapers has any doubt. You know, you've had uh, hundreds of people dying out of uh, hunger, out of economic distress, committing suicide because they could not feed their children, uh, you know, uh, dying because they were uh, insecure about access to food and started walking towards their villages and dying in accidents, being crushed by trains and whatnot. So, you know, there is no doubt that food insecurity has been exacerbated very significantly during this lockdown. Uh, we have some data about it. We don't have a lot, lot of data. We don't have the kind of data we would like to have simply because uh, for various reasons, generation of that data has not happened. Uh, this, now, in that situation, given that the food Corporation of India and government of India is sitting on a very large stock of food grain would have been a silver line. This would have been one thing that you could have used. You have actually been wasting money on preserving this grain because you are not distributing. And this is taxpayers money, you know, this is not taxpayer. So taxpayers money is being, being spent for not distributing the grain. For not distributing the grain and to ensure that the, the grain is not destroyed, you are for year after year, you are just holding on to the grain, spending money on preserving it because you are not unwilling to distribute it. If this is one case, you know, you could argue that if NREG has to be expanded, government has to raise the resources, where will government get money from? Yeah. Here you have a situation where if you distribute it, you would save money. You are spending money on preserving this grain. If you just said, okay, we are going to just open the granaries and give it for free, you would save money. There is no argument for not distributing this grain. You are sitting on, you know, some 500, 600,000, 600 lakh crores of excess food stock beyond what you need for your strategic reserves. The buffer stock norms, you're sitting on a massive mountain of stock grain over and above what you need for all exigencies and what can be a more bigger crisis than what we are going through okay but even if you keep that part of the grain aside you are still talking of you know hundreds of lakhs of uh, tons of grain which you're which is sitting in your granaries you're spending on on uh, preserving it but you're not distributing so that's a criminal thing to do. You know, uh, there have been a lot of uh, controversy about whether how much grain is rotting or not. There's no point getting into that. You know, I mean, not all the data are made public. One makes estimates based on what is available right. and so on. But, you know, I mean, if you're going to tell me that no grains are rotting in in, in go down the food corporation of India, I don't think anybody is going to believe Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And nobody is disputing but, that we have a huge surplus anyway. But yeah, nobody is disputing that there is a huge surplus. What is the argument for you to not just give it to two people to, to feed them? You see, so so there is, uh, some, you know, that's really something that uh, requires an answer. And it's an answer that people have to ask. You yeah. see, that, that brings me to your second question. Yeah. What is What is to be done? You see, I really think that uh, two things. One is that... Uh, you know, the anger that uh, uh, is simmering in the, uh, among the working people of this country Absolutely. is going to come out. You know? believe that? I, oh, I believe it. I, 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 I mean, there, there, there's no two way about it. I mean, uh, it's just incredible. I mean, if, if it doesn't come out, I don't know uh, 
what to make of this world you know but the point is that you are sitting on something where something so seriously criminal has happened in terms of depriving people of their livelihoods in terms of depriving people of that i don't know so where just repeat that again yeah. i'm saying yeah. that something so serious has happened in terms of depriving people of their livelihoods and in terms of depriving people of their bread that if we can't uh, you know hold this government accountable for this then i don't know where, where this country would go so the question is that uh, uh, would the, these the, the point is that would these questions be asked you see and and i think there is no two way about it you just have to ask these questions and i do see that something of that kind is happening if you look at the last couple of weeks various protests by workers by kisans have happened where people have you know uh, maintaining some uh, you know physical distancing and so on but, but people protest. have people have come out to the the offices of the block development officers or or district collectorates and and so on and at least done some protests so you know i do think that people are coming out but you know all these millions of people who walk back home they have to be mobilized they have to be told that this is not your fate yeah. you know you have to ask the question why were you made to go through this yeah. and some you have to make somebody give an answer to that question and who is responsible you cannot accept this to be your fate you cannot say that main to gareeb hu meri kismat mein hai this is not your kismat okay this is somebody is doing and that person should be called to answer you know so so i i see that there is no other way about it there is uh, uh, somebody has to to answer for this and that uh, can only happen if there is large scale mobilization where people stand up and and speak up you see if you're going to have opening up of malls if you're going to have opening up of mandis if you're going to have opening up of markets if you're going to have opening up of temples and and mosques and churches there is no reason why people should come out and protest on this on this you see so so i do hope that uh, that glorious uh, protest that we were seeing before this lockdown amazing would uh, uh, sort of gather momentum again and perhaps uh, become bigger in the days to come and, and uh, uh, force this government to to give answers i just want to end by saying one thing if you don't mind is that as a journalist come activist i just want to just add soft to you for the kind of uh, journalistic work i mean apart from anything else i think that in in a day when one is seeing a paucity of this kind of work coming out from the journalistic arena to have material like this being put together uh, so it, it's also a social responsibility i think i i don't know how i would have looked at myself yeah. if at a time like this i had not done what i had done right yeah. it's, it's an amazing piece of work and i think that regardless of where people are in the political spectrum left center or right i think it must be read because it's based on just hard data even if you have disagreements on uh, i think this is a moment for india's left it's a real moment of challenge for india's left the wider left. and i don't think we could get a better moment than this i don't know what will happen with it but uh, uh, because it has been this up this unspeakable misery on the ground unspeakable misery on the ground which all of us have seen and we continue to see we've been tracking some of these migrant stories back home because of the work that cjp did with migrant workers in uh, mumbai which was very little all we could do was give ration but we did it with a lot of humility and we've been tracking their stories back home and i can't even begin to tell you uh, i mean the kind of uh, work that the india's villages under covid series has done and your report has done i just hope that policy makers uh, look at it very very seriously because uh, the, the, it's a moment of reckoning for india it's a real moment of reckoning for india and where india and indian politics sorry because we lost you but i was just saying it was a, it's a moment of reckoning for india you know really and where indian politics and social movements will go and uh, like you were saying we just can't afford to lose this moment because it's it's just uh, i think it's possibly opened up a rise to schisms that were already there yeah. uh, very very clearly there but yeah. i think that the callousness with which the system dealt with them 
it's just just un unfavorable so i think uh, uh, for the political opposition this is really a moment of reckoning yeah. just a few last words from you if you want to say yeah, something no well, i think i've <laughs> spoken a lot no no no, no. I'm just kidding. but no yeah no i i agree with you this is uh, absolutely a moment uh, like never before i also think that uh you know i i i in fact been asking this question to a lot of my friends and peers and colleagues I and mean, particularly those who are senior to me in age have you ever seen anything like this and i have not met one person yet uh, who said uh, yes you know in the 1960s you know the food crisis nothing like this you know I and mean, what we are seeing today is something that's actually uh it surely is something for me in my lifetime is not something that i've seen yeah. and it's something that is uh, uh, so, uh, uh, is not something that i can ever forget yeah. Yeah. so 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 i i just uh, think that uh, at this is the moment when we have to all uh, you know uh, decide what where you want to be yeah. Yeah. you know what role you want to play in this uh, in this country and in this society you know what's your what's your what's your responsibility thank you so much thank you so much it's been a pleasure to be here